What were mammals doing during the time of the dinosaurs? Most of us think of little shrew-like or mouse-sized creatures running around the feet of the dinosaurs, but in fact there were all kinds of body plans and types of mammals in all kinds of environments. There were flying squirrel-like animals, there were creatures like beavers who could swim underwater, and there were meat-eaters the size of wolverines that ate baby dinosaurs. Hi, my name is James Gurney. I'm an illustrator for Scientific American, and I want to show you what the mammals look like during the time of dinosaurs. I start by sketching some shrew-like insectivores and an anteater with its young hiding out in the tree to avoid predators. And here's a beaver-like creature from Madagascar and a heavy-built Triassic animal in a more dynamic pose than we usually see him. And a monkey-like animal seen in the trees at night as if lit by a flash camera. But the one I really want to paint is based on this fossil found in China of a badger-sized animal found with the bones of a ceratopsian hatchling in its stomach. I start by doing a small sketch in color just to visualize the scene. It's scurrying across the forest floor with the captured prize in its mouth, and I do a couple other sketches in gouache in black and white to work out other variations. After these sketches are reviewed by the scientists, I can start the next step. Okay, I'm down in the workshop and I want to get started on making a maquette. Even though I've only got about a week to do both paintings, I'm going to spend a day making a maquette using this drawing of just the head of the mammal and the dinosaur in his jaws because that's the key area that's most important to get right. I'm going to use Model Magic, which is a craft air dry clay that uh, is made for kids, actually, and it's, uh, it's good, uh, inexpensive, quick to use. I make the eyes out of uh, stuffed animal eyes and plastic beads. This paints up quite easily with acrylic paints, and now I have something that I can refer to while I do the pencil drawing on illustration board. The next question I need to ask is, what kind of mood and color idea do I want to use on this painting? And for this one, I want it to be more dark and rainy and mysterious. I'm always trying to project myself into the world I'm painting and to connect it with my own life. And when I think about this scene, even though it happened millions of years ago, I think about the dinosaurs ruling the earth during the daytime, but the mammals have the advantage at night, especially a small predator like this guy. If he's going to raid a nest, he's going to do it at night. And I remember when we had a little nesting shelf for robins, but it was a rainy night, a dark rainy night, when we heard a commotion out and back, and a raccoon climbed up there to steal all of the hatchlings and kill them all. Now these ferns will be a good stand-in for Cretaceous ferns. I might have to change them a little, but uh, it's good to start with something real. I can bring these into my studio. And I paint them by laying down a general tone and then cutting the background in front of it and then building some of the lighter tones. If you're enjoying this video, you'll love the longer version, which is more than a half an hour, which goes into a lot of detail about the process I use to do these paintings, including tricks for painting whiskers and fur, quick sketch techniques, how to texture a surface, and how to keep a board from warping. Also, course corrections, laying in color, and different techniques for getting furry textures. To find out more about the longer version of this video, go to gumroad.com and visit the James Gurney page there. Now that the painting is wrapped and shipped to New York, the design director of Scientific American, Michael Mrak, will come up with a cover design and also a graphic design for the interior spread. 